everyone. Um, my name is Kristen Gallant, and I am the Outreach Librarian here at uh, the Walter Stern Library. Uh, we're excited to have you here today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I do want to ask that um, after each of the panelists is done speaking, if you could wait till all three have finished before you raise your hands for questions. Thank you. So let's begin. In his address at the Youth March for Integrated Schools on April 18, 1959, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, make a career of humanity. Commit yourself to the noble struggle for equal rights. You will make a better person of yourself, a greater nation of your country, and a finer world to live in. As many of you know, each year the Kirk County Library hosts its One Book Project program. This year's One Book is A Mighty Long Way, My Journey to Justice at Little Rock Central High School. The author, Carlotta Walls Lanier is one of the surviving members of the Little Rock Nine, and her book is a memoir of her experiences during a period of integration in America's public schools. Throughout the book, there is the undercurrent of other trials faced by the othered. Communities such as um, African American and Hispanic and Latino experienced inequality in education, housing, and generational wealth, to name a few. Today's panel will discuss those inequalities that provide a broader context of a mighty long way. And in doing so, we continue the work of looking at uncomfortable truths, of having difficult conversations, in the hopes that those of you here in the audience will carry on Dr. King's call to commit ourselves to the noble struggle for equity. Recently, the city of Bakersfield adopted a new slogan, the sound of something better. This slogan inspired the title for this event. We not only want our community to sound better to those who are coming to Bakersfield, but to actually be better. Today's panelists are Donato Cruz, who's our archive specialist in the Walter W. Stern Library. Donato will be speaking to you about the practice of redlining and its effects on public education here in Bakersfield. Our second panelist, Carolyn Lane is a lecturer in the Department of Human Development, Child, Adolescent, and Family Studies, as well as Ethnic and Liberal Studies. She is also an EDD candidate in CSUB's Doctoral Program of Educational Leadership. Carolyn will be presenting today on being a Muslim student in the public education system here in Kern County. And our final panelist today is Eileen Diaz, who is a graduate research assistant in the Historical Research Center here at the w, uh, Walter Stern W. Lever. And Eileen is also a graduate student working on her thesis in the Department of History. She will be presenting today on policing practices here in Bakersfield. And again, I just ask that you hang on to your questions that you may have uh, for our panelists after everyone is done speaking. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for coming today. So I'm going to start. My name is Donato Cruz. and. This is not going to be a traditional PowerPoint, you'll see me scroll, so. So I'm going to start with the history of uh, Hans Jansen Brandt, and he was actually a Danish uh, immigrant that came to the United States. He was born um, in 1880, and he came to California at 17 years old. And he worked for a logging company, and eventually he worked up his way to becoming a real estate agent. He ended up working um, to develop neighborhoods. He was also one of the original promoters of the Security Trust Company, the largest individual bank in Kern County, and he served on its board of directors and its vice president until it became the Bank of America National Trust Saving Association branch. He built the neighborhoods of Laguna Square, Lincoln Park, Sunset Park, and Holby Park. Uh, that is track 1099, so I'll be talking about the Holby Park the most. And this is uh, closer to like the older downtown neighborhoods. And this is one of his flyers from his neighborhood. So Holby Park is located by um, A Street, if those who are familiar, but I have the map right there. Uh, for those that aren't familiar, this is closer to what will later become the, the original Southwest and later the Old Southwest. But this uh, track was actually racially segregated. And I think for this one, I wanna complicate the discussion as far as um, when people say that racial discrimination came exclusively from the South. We see a European immigrant become real estate agent and also segregate communities of color, right? And uh, just to show where the map, but later I'll add context to the map, you can kind of see where it is in uh, relation to modern day Bakersfield. 
So I'm going to start with what are racially restrictive covenants. So between 1938 and 1950, whenever you bought home, you had you homes, you had a covenant, which is a legal agreement and restrictions. I think similar to what people refer to HOAs, right? So between 1938 and 1950, they included race restrictions. And this is some of the template language. And I'll talk about the history more, but this is for Holy Park of that neighborhood. And uh, if we see the race restrictions, section E reads, said premises shall not be used or occupied by any person who is not of the white or Caucasian race. And these are, this is pretty much template language, very universally used around the United States, um, from the north to the south to the west. So this is what's um, at least influencing racial segregation at the neighborhood level, right? So beyond the, um, actually at the track level, so we hit the full neighborhoods, and I'll describe some of that entirely later. And this will be kind of the start of the main discussion. So um, this sign reads, no color trade solicited, and the caption reads, sign on roadside found in Bakersfield, California. California. Uh, 10 July 1946. So in this, I kind of want to show uh, something that's been kind of out of reach for historians, and it's uh, racially uh, segreg segregation signs in Bakersfield. And uh, I've talked to a lot of scholars, and they, they haven't really seen these, right? Uh, what we do have is evidence that they did exist, and I was able to find a photograph, and now it's been donated here to the Historical Research Center for research. Uh, but I think it adds to some of the tangibility of segregation to see the photographs. And I kind of want to premise you with, um, do you have conversations of racial, racist legacies, racial injustice, and segregation in your town? And I'd like you to think about that as I go through the discussion. So 1938, the Federal, Federal Housing Authority and the Homeowners Loan Corporation uh, established these maps. They're race, residential security maps, and these are more, more commonly referred to as redlining. Red most likely meant colors, uh, neighborhood of color, and they meant the least amount of uh, financial investment. That's why it's labeled residential security map, and it's the security <coughs> of their investment. And A meant the best, green <coughs> the second best, and the third meant the third best. So between A, B, and C was financeable, and D was not, right? So. Uh, the FHA created maps for a lot of cities, but Bakersfield does not have a city. And this is not a uh, city map, and this is not suggested because it didn't have a map. The racial segregation did not exist in Bakersfield. The reason they didn't make a map is because Bakersfield didn't have a large, po large enough population for them to draw a map, right? So it's only for towns with moderate population. That's why Fresno has one. In 1938, they have a high enough population to draw a map, right? So, but during that time period, they also Actually, sorry, I have the backtrack. So, um, and these maps were also based on um, desirability, right? And this is all going around the nation. This is actually grading information from an East Bakersfield neighborhood. And some of it is civic, social, and community centers. And some of it's also what is around the neighborhood, like um, low vacancy rates, hospitals, high schools, desirable shopping centers, single family residential zones, Things like that add to what they thought was desirable neighborhoods as well. So this is, isn't really to eradicate poverty, this is more to create new housing. So this is kind of the start of that suburban expansion that we see um, really explode during the post-war era. So this is uh, from the FHA manual, the Federal Housing Authority manual. In 1939, they recommended um, race restrictions. So we see G, this is like the, like the manual where they um, kind of taught lenders what was desirable, what was approvable, when they went to a house, what they would do. So this, uh, this is the template language for those restrictive covenants. And we see G, G says prohibition of the occupancy of properties except by the race of which they are intended. So the FHA at federal levels is, is recommending segregation, right? So federal sponsored segregation. And this is what affects the whole United States, right? Not just the South, but not just the North, not just the West, right? So we're having the expansion. This happened from Bakersfield to Los Angeles, right? And San Francisco, and other urban places like Phoenix, and so on. And this is um, just template language from a Bakersfield covenant. 
It says, no part of said property shall be used or occupied or permitted to be occupied by any person not of the white or Caucasian race, except such persons as are engaged in the bona fide domestic employment of the owner thereof or of those holding under said owner. So this is also a socioeconomic statement, right, for those that are much higher and can afford domestic labor or live in health. Uh, this is saying that that's the only thing they will allow for uh, racial minorities to be help, not to be actual residents, right? And they're making that distinction very clear and legally, right? So this is also the Code of Ethics from the National Association of Real Estate Boards. And uh, that's on the left, and on the right is the Code of Ethics for the Real Estate Association for California. And they're, they're very similar, they're just like sister organizations. You have a national organization, and then you have a state organization also making similar recommendations, but they're also having some of those connotations. And you see this, they, they label it under their code of ethics. So it's kind of racism as ethics in a way. And it reads, uh, for least for California, a realtor shall never be instrumental in introducing a neighborhood, a character of property or use will be clearly detrimental to the property values of that neighborhood. And uh, the code of ethics for the National Real Estate Board says any individual, right? So they're, at a certain level, they're also recommending race restrictions, and they're using the FHA's uh, standard of finance as well. So with this, it's also symbolic that um, this month they apologized. The California Real Estate Association has apologized for their role in racial segregation. So I think it's pretty symbolic. They're uh, specifically apologizing for the Rumford Fair Housing Act in 1963, where um, Rumford, I believe he's a senator in California who passed the first Fair Housing Act in the nation and in California. And uh, they, uh, the California Real Estate Association sponsored a proposition a year later in 1964, and they were able to get rid of that Fair Housing Act. And um, so they've had a deep role and engagement in racial segregation. They've apologized for a series, and they've also made recommendations that they will um, advocate for uh, affordable housing now. And that just happened at um, October 14th of this year. So I'll talk about the map. So I kind of explained what the racial restrictive covenants. This is how expansive it is in Bakersfield. So between 1938 and 1950, 171 neighborhoods were either segregated or created to be segregated. And I'll explain that a little bit. Some of these neighborhoods are actually older than 1938 but they amend them to have a race restrictions and other covenants in 1938. So sometimes we have neighborhoods from like 1890, 1910, and they submit these uh, racially restrictive covenants much later, right? Because this is also the standard of finance, right? Race restriction is included in finance. So we can see the expansive state. This is just Bakersfield. This isn't the whole 171, but 171 in Kern County, right? So this is just kind of the greater Bakersfield. And we can see here, if you're familiar with the size of uh, Bakersfield College, that's Bakersfield College in the blue right there. So uh, you can see how big these neighborhoods are at some places. And uh, CSUB is about twice the size, so you can kind of get the grasp of how large these neighborhoods are, right? So kind of, you know, take it in. So we can see uh, this is uh, the East Bakersfield expansion. Now the demographics have shifted, but I think that's a discussion for another day. But uh, we also get the Southwest, right here, this is the old Southwest where we have the 58 Brundage, and then we have the development of Oildale and some of these neighborhoods over here. And then interesting enough, we also have some um, namesake people that developed neighborhoods here that were racially segregated. We had uh, Floyd Ming, which was a former uh, Board of Supervisor, and also the, lake, lake, the namesake for Lake Ming. He built tract uh, 1350, and it was racially segregated. We also have uh, uh, Colonel Howard Nichols. Named, uh, he is a namesake for Howard Nichols School. And uh, he built tract 1088 and 1090. And the school's actually named for him because he did a, large, a lot of real estate development, but um, it was also racially segregated. And the school re remains to be under his name, so. So this one I'm gonna propose the other side of racism, which is Bakersfield, um, it's a comfortable place to live. And especially uh, after the 1952 earthquake, we have a lot of urban development. Bakersfield College gets moved from um, where it used to be at Kern County, uh, Kern Union High School, 
now at Bakersfield High School, it gets moved to the East Bakersfield in 1956. We have kind of that repositioning of the city to the east, and that's why I put Bakersfield College, because you're seeing some of that influence move east, and the rest of some of the influence move to the southwest. So it's kind of that repositioning of power to the east. So we have a lot of advertisements of how great Bakersfield is and how modern housing is. Uh, and some of the advertisements that I've seen is uh, they're advertising like air conditioning and things that we think are very modern and amenities. And this is another start tale. Uh, in 1950 is how, uh, what were the conditions of the segregated parts of East Bakersfield. And I won't read the full caption for the sake of time. I actually have it in the QR code if you guys are interested right here on the side of the tables. This is a article, it's actually a letter written to the NAACP's uh, regional chapter in San Francisco and it's from a local agent here. And he's writing about the uh, kind of stark conditions of housing and uh, he's describing the uh, lack of sanitary facilities, uh, that they do have a um, fire station, but it is segregated, it's all uh, black, you see right here, and it's just kind of talking about the conditions, right, and the photographs as well. And I'm gonna transition to education. So this is kind of the other part of it. So in 1935, there was a thesis that came out that spoke about the conditions of Mexican Americans in California. And uh, this is based, this table was based on a survey that was sent out to real estate agents in 1934, where they asked real estate agents and real estate boards whether they practice racial segregation. And here is actually an ABC order list. It's not in the order of which one is most segregated, but it's, it's a list of everyone who uh, admitted or um, clarified that they racially segregated their towns. Bigger schools on that list. So that has an effect on education. So here's another master's thesis that actually went and tallied up all the racial concentration of all the schools. Uh, here I have highlighted Lincoln School, which is it was was the segregated school in Bakersfield, and we can see the um, the very different demographics compared to the other school. It's 0.2% uh, white. It's 73.9% uh, black, uh, and 34.34.8% uh, Mexican. We could also see some other places like Jefferson where they don't um, have an African American population or Horace Mann that also doesn't have statistics or Williams or Washington School that has one student so that's not a registerable you know, percentage. So, and we can also see the complete opposite of, you know, in some places how uh, white the schools are, right? We have like Emerson at the time, uh, we have 697 white students, we have 24 black and we have 11 Mexican. And uh, so just to show you the kind of the statistics. So, and this is um, some of that narrative that they got. And this is a Lincoln School is located near the colored section of Bakersfield and serves the Negro children. And a few Mexicans attempts to enter Negro schools and white schools are discouraged. White families are leaving near the Negro areas are asked to send their children to other schools in the city. And then this is a characterization of a teacher that taught in Lincoln School. This is one sixth grade teacher, teacher openly discussed her, you can see the racially explicit word, within hearing of Negro and white, white students. The teacher was from the South and all students were aware of her feelings and her outspoken remarks, so you can imagine the effects on her students. And this is a photograph of Lincoln School. And then, I'm gonna skip some slides because I'm running out of time. So. But we can see the uh, racial um, kind of like characterization of that neighborhood, right? The segregation advertisement that this is a colored only home and this is in that neighborhood. And then I'm gonna change it to, um, this is a nerd from 1969. Uh, Jesse Yakala is still alive and he was a civil rights activist. He actually attended CUCB but didn't graduate. Just wanna put that there. We were able to digitize his collection. So this is a, kind of a written excerpt, but I'm gonna, just to show it, but I'm gonna play an excerpt from this oral history that was recorded here as well, and we have a copy of it. And he's gonna talk about the conditions in 1969 at the Mount Vernon School, which was a, um, minor, a majority Mexican school at the time, and how that eventually uh, led up to a uh, lawsuit um, to desegregate Baker. So we're not gonna talk about it after this clip.
Give us one second. <laughs> Uh, this was Bob Hardy's school. Oh, okay. There we go. Well, when it started affecting my, my children, my son, uh, when he first went to elementary school, I remember one year at the very beginning of the school that uh, uh, there was some construction going on. In the, at, uh, and this was Bob Hardy's school. There was some construction going on, and they had no electricity, no fire alarms, no air conditioning. No, and of course, they just had water coolers back in those days. Uh, so the fire department actually, I think, if I remember that, this is going to be fact check, but I think the fire department condemned the school. And so, and I got wind of this through my wife and, you know, some Josie Hyman and some other folks there. So what we did on Thursday, we passed out some, uh, some flyers around the community, keep the kids up. Sorry. So in 1969, uh, Jesse Kala and among other parents went to um, to the school, and uh, this ended up being like a publicized event, and this ended up being the start of the desegregation lawsuit that started in 1975 against the Bakersfield City School District, and it wasn't settled until 1985, where they had uh, certain requirements that they had to meet to desegregate, and um, the desegregation order was not actually lifted until uh, 2011 to where they found that racial concentration was a higher mix already in schools and that they didn't have to follow these desegregation orders. So, but we can see that, um, you know, from 1954, Brown versus Board of Education to 1984, it takes about 30 years to hit Bakersfield, right? To kind of get into there and say, you know, uh, we have to do better, right? So, and, and actually this is the, 53rd anniversary of that boycott in 1969. It actually started in October as well. And then I want to leave with one remark. Uh, history is not abstract. It continues to affect us every day. As historians and future scholars, I encourage you to ask more questions, research different places, and look for history outside of traditional institutions. In the spirit of social justice, I encourage you to research for change. As a researcher and presenter, you may face challenges, troubling conversations, but I, but do not let that discourage you. You will never know what discoveries you'll make. So, and then uh, later on, I'll show you my bit. So, is this some books I have recommendation? If you have any questions, and uh, this, these are some of the archives that I visited as well for research. So, but I'll pass it on to my other presenters. Christian at the time, so 
We're doing our Christmas puzzle, Christmas music's playing. Yes, we don't have to do any work, right? And I look over at one of my classmates and he's got this look of frustration and he's kind of groaning like, oh, how am I supposed to know this stuff? He's Jewish. What does he know about Santa Claus, right? So I don't know what I knew or who told me, but I told him, you know, you don't have to do it. They can't make you. It's against the law. So I said, tell the teacher. So I was a little social justice activist before I, before I knew it. And of course he did. He went on to make a presentation and everybody learned about Hanukkah. Um, and then my last little um, vignette here, I think of uh, first year of school for one of my friends, or who would become one of my friends. Um, she looked a little lost, and I asked her, do you know where you're going? And I took her out to recess, and on our way, we see a line of sixth graders outside the library. Somebody looks up, starts whispering, and next thing you know, the entire class is laughing at her. Why? She has a skirt to her feet, and she's wearing a little bandana as a scarf. She's African-American Muslim. So those experiences you know, taught me that there were other religions other than my own at the time I was Christian. And I would later go on to become Muslim um, in high school, but I'm focusing more on the, the earlier experiences, so I'll leave my stories there, because I could go on all day. So I want to bring it over to California. California's more progressive, right? We're, we're over racism. That was a million years ago. We don't have a problem, right? Um, some of you know the answer to that, I hope. Uh, so I'm looking, my research is centered around Muslim experiences in public school. And what we're finding, let's see here, let's start. What do we know about Muslims in California and in the country? Let's start with that. If I can get this working here. Okay, so this is from Pew Research, just showing you. It goes up from um, 2007 to 2020. Um, so this shows you that the Muslim population has been steadily increasing. So we know that, that the population is growing across the country and particularly in California. We're always ahead of the game, right? Um, that Muslims are also experiencing more and more discrimination. So post 9-11, post Trump, we've seen an exponential rise in hate crimes across the board, but for Muslims in particular. Um, and there's definitely an intersectionality between their ethnicity and the, but we'll get into that. Um, let's keep going. So, some of my theoretical frameworks for the research that I'm doing are centered around these three main ideas. So, just a really quick explanation of these, just so we're on the same page. Um, racism, legal racism, racism in laws and policy, that big buzz for critical race theory, um, is, is the grounding for my research. So, we're talking about anti-black racism, that is not mutually exclusive from anti-Muslim racism. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later too. Um, cultural racism is kind of how I boiled this down. So the East versus the East versus the West, that clash of civilizations. When you hear people say, "Oh, they're not compatible with American values," that's rebranding of this same theory, Orientalism. Um, so, 1975 is still current. Um, and then we have religious racism, anti-Muslim discrimination, and I'm using um, Khaled Beydoun's um, definition of that, where he takes critical race theory and puts it together with that East versus West or anti-Eastern, um, anti-Muslim sentiment, and it comes together to form his definition of Islamophobia. And um, I can go way into that, but I'll just say that it's both individual um, person to person, it's also structural, institutional schools, um, and then it's dialectical from big leaders down. So some of the rhetoric, rhetoric that you hear drives some of the behaviors, and we've seen that with the increase in hate crimes. So I'll move on from my theories here. Um, so what do we know about Muslims here? Kern County has a large Muslim population, and I kind of leave it a little bit vague because that's part of the issues, as you'll find out, trying to find exact numbers. Um, if you know the Muslim population here, anyone would, anyone would tell you that the majority of the people are Yemeni American. Um, and you'll find large concentrations of Yemeni Americans in some of the other cities that have already been researched as well. But I think our, our population has some particularly interesting characteristics. Um, 
One being that many of them are from the same area. They have, tend to have, and this is a generalization for the purposes of, of what I'm just talking about today, but lower educational levels from their home country. Um, and there's some other issues, whether like parents or, or the mothers are learning English and have, but we'll, we'll get into that. I'll, I'll be all day talking about it. I'll leave that for some questions. And then the Kern County Muslims are just generally under-researched. Um, when you look at the bigger studies by Muslim organizations like CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, they look at big places like the Bay Area, Los Angeles County. Kern County is nowhere on the list. Fresno made it, but we didn't get on there. So this is an area that really needs to be looked at since we do have a big and growing population. Um, and I'll have some more things to support that in a second. Let's go to the next slide before I jump ahead. So this is one of the points that really stuck out to me, is that all the yellow are Spanish speakers, which we know that. We know that most of our English language learners, ELLs, are, are speakers of Spanish. But after Spanish, what's next? So there's several languages listed here, which is probably too small for any of us to read. But the, the second and third most common languages, which keep flipping spaces, are Punjabi and Arabic. Um, in one of the biggest districts in the area, um, an administrator told me that Arabic was his second most spoken language. So depending on what part of town you're in, I'm sure that would fluctuate. Um, so what do, we, what do we want to know? So some areas of concern or interest are um, structural, so we have data and visibility or erasure, and that centers around the Swana population. So you're talking about Southwest Asian and North African, and there's a push for that to be added to the federal census, but also in institutional data, it's not on there. It's not at the universities, in the colleges, elementary schools. There's no accountability. Um, they're labeled as white, and in particular, our Yemeni Americans do not necessarily fit that uh, visual definition, I would say. And that's going to matter in programs and outcomes. We don't know what the academics are. We don't know what behavioral things are. Are they being suspended more? Are they punished more harshly? I hear things, but that's not really science, right? Um, so then also we have the structural element of curriculum and um, some of the districts are advocating for culturally sustaining and culturally re relevant pedagogies. Uh, I forgot to put my citation there, but Gladson Billings and Paris are two of the uh, proponents of that. Um, that would be a way to address some of these issues, not just for Muslim students, but for all students, incorporating the voices of the minoritized populations. We need to hear their voices, their stories, and we need to get those stories first, right? Um, and then moving on to individual, we have peer-to-peer um, -peer and adults on campus, those interactions, and what the research is showing in other areas is that bullying is a very big issue. Of course, you know, we all got bullied, no big deal, right? But Muslims are showing that they're bullied more than twice as much as their non-Muslim peers. Um, and some of those bullies are teachers and adults on campus, and I think we can do better than that, right? And the dialectical part there is a person in authority driving behaviors of students by saying these things and, and doing things in class, but I, I'm gonna get off on a tangent if I stop there. Okay, so Muslims in California, Islamophobia report by CARE. Um, here's some of the things, I just kind of put some of their statistics up. So their study shows some of the pre-COVID, post, or during COVID, numbers, and I didn't put the during COVID numbers, but basically dropped by about 20%. So that kind of tells you maybe something's going on in that physical space, right? At least that's what it tells me, I don't know. I'll leave it up to you. But 47.1% were bullied um, in school, and then we have 39.46% uh, witnessed bullying, so either they were bullied or they saw someone bullied. And um, bullying, the definition of that can vary but some type of discriminatory act. It doesn't necessarily be, mean physical. But um, moving on, we have 29.72% saw anti-Muslim uh, social media posts. So for those of you that haven't been in school in a while, middle schoolers, school, uh, 
bullying does not end when you leave school. It's a 24-7 thing. I mean, you don't get a break from it. So the bullying, the harassment, the social media, everything is going on during school, after school, all night. It, it's, it's going on, and it's, I mean, it's kind of contributing to suicide rates, but that's a whole other paper. Um, moving on. Islamophobia. So, um, a little over 30% reported their hijab was pulled or offensively touched in some way. Um, I can attest to that. I had mine pulled off in, in high school. But anyway, um, a quarter reported an adult making Islamophobic comments. An adult could be staff or teacher, anyone um, on campus. And then uh, over 55% said they felt unsafe being at school because they were Muslim. A lot of us might feel unsafe for other reasons, but for it to be religiously um, targeted. So that was a quick kind of walkthrough. I wanted to make sure I got to all my major points. There's so many other things I, I can talk about, but I will leave that to your um, questions. Uh, I think that's, I'm gonna stop there and, and leave more time for questions and answers. And there's my QR code if you wanna email me. when you guys first walked into the entrance, if you see her hand out there. And if you sign uh, the sign-up sheet, we'll make sure that we can email you a digital copy of her handout as well. So our next speaker is Eileen. Let's welcome Eileen to the podium. disturbing the peace, so I argue that there really is no crime 
uh, in the context of this case. Uh, what had happened was Earl Johnson uh, was pretty taken with Miss Mildred Johnson and decided he would try to ask her out uh, via a note. So the note here, in case you probably cannot read it, um, it says, if I am not insult uh, between me and you, how about a date? I hope this doesn't insult you. If so, uh, once the other side, I'll pay for the trouble. It's a little uh, illegible, but the context being he wanted to go out with her, which is cool. Um, however, Earl Johnson was a little nervous to give her the note, so he asked Webb to hand it to her. Um, the significance in this case lies in this area of the memo. So I'd like to direct your attention to the red box. Um, the handwritten portion suggests it reads, uh, two Negroes, in case you cannot read it. Um, it suggests that the race of these gentlemen was not initially important in this case, seeing as it was handwritten after the memo was typed and printed. Um, and then I'd like to direct your attention to the underlying section of the memo. And it reads, hold this until we get the address of these Negroes and have someone eat them up. So that is, word for word, an intentional call for violence towards these gentlemen rather than an investigation by these officers in the district attorney's office. For our next case, it's uh, the case of Wise and Tucker versus Langston. Uh, on October, sorry, on, in April 27th, 1943, investigators were called to the crossroads of Owen 11th Street in the Old Leander Sunset neighborhood. Uh, Mary Langston, a white woman, complained that the children of two, back, two black families uh, by the last names of Wise and Tucker, were harassing her. Upon investigation, officers found that Langston was actually the aggressor in the situation, and the memo further calls her a Christian science nut. Um, what was going on was she was uh, berating everybody in the neighborhood, including the children, and upon further investigation, they found that she was the one harassing the children and those around her. Even though uh, these documents uh, suggest or clearly state that Langston was in the wrong, investigators still treated uh, the Wise and Tucker families as the aggressors in this situation, and you can see that uh, through this section here. Uh, so in the first arrow, it points to a section that reads, all colored people, meaning the defendants involved were all people of color. In this case, uh, color used to describe the uh, black families. Um, so it shows that Dupes uh, took a particular interest in the race of these families um, because it was uh, a case involving also a white woman. Uh, the second arrow, and I'll read it for you, it says, please see if you can throw scare into the defendant so they will leave her alone. Uh, this section shows investigator Dupes uh, call for more violence towards these uh, black plaintiff, or defendant in this case, uh, and he even goes so far as to provide the address for Mr. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Wise, uh, just below the, the white arrow area. So cases one and two show us what happens in cases of disturbing the peace. Um, what happens when a major crime is committed? So this next case, um, I'm gonna issue a content warning. It is a case regarding uh, a sexual assault. I'm not going to go into any details, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, so on the night of July 13, 1943, in McFarland on the Melcher Ranch, Mrs. Miyaki, a Japanese uh, farm worker on the Melcher farm, um, went to the shower room and you know, she's going to take a shower. She was met with uh, Guy Wilson, who is the defendant in this case, um, a white man, who came in and tried to assault her. At this time, Ms. Miyaki let out a huge scream, and her colleagues came to her aid. Uh, <coughs> there they found Wilson uh, with wet clothes. Despite multiple witness accounts and substantial evidence that warrants an investigation, such as Wilson's wet clothes, presumably from when he tried to grab Ms. Miyaki, uh, Ms. Mrs. Miyaki's case was thrown out. So in this first section here, I'll read it for you. Uh, it shows that the defendant, uh, Mr. Wilson, being a white male, was only made to pay $25 as a fee for disturbing the peace while the assault charge was thrown out. Uh, the second section here below um, is an entire dismissal of the case and 
Dukes himself, as it's signed in this memo, attributed the, the dismissal of this case to the uh, Japanese farm workers being excitable and making the case worse than it is. And he also, in case you cannot see, uses a slur often used towards Japanese individuals. So what does all this mean? Um, these three cases I just showed you show confirmation of racial bias and show confirmation of what many people of color and communities of color know to be true. And that is that they are quite frequently and excessively persecuted and prosecuted by the police. Uh, as you can see that in the Wise and Tucker case. Uh, also, there is a disparity in the treatment of black and white defendants as seen in the Wise and Tucker case, also in the Miyake and Wilson case. So in case number two being the Wise and Tucker case, the defendants in this situation were black and were treated with uh, threats and violence, whereas the defendant in the third case with Wilson and Miyake, the white defendant was just charged $25 for disturbing the peace. Uh, the other, there's also a severity, uh, disparity in the severity of how these, keep these cases were handled. So uh, dupes tend, like, we can see that in case number three, he severely downplayed the crime in question and exaggerated the circumstances of cases one and two. Uh, other cases in this collection uh, do not mention the race of the defendants um, or complainants unless a person of color is involved. So my sources come from this uh, small collection upstairs in the Historical Research Center, and the majority of them don't mention race, uh, like I said, unless there's a person of color involved. Uh, while these primary source documents only cover a short period of Duke's tenure, one can imagine the injustices people of color have faced under his authority, and it gives us a brief glimpse into, glimpse into how the DA office and law enforcement operated um, in the 1910s and well into the 1940s, uh, beginning and ending with Dukes' tenure in local law enforcement. So how have we changed? Uh, I argue we really haven't much in the last 100 or so years. Um, this is kind of evident by the uh, 2020 Black Lives Matter demonstrations. So for those that aren't aware or aren't familiar, the Black Lives Matter um, organization uh, its mission is to eradicate white supremacy and build local power to intervene violence inflicted on black communities by the state and vigilantes. By combating and countering acts of violence, creating space for black imagination and innovation, and centering on black joy, we are winning immediate improvements in our lives. And that is a direct quote from their mission statement. Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement has been around since 2013 uh, in response to the Trayvon Martin case and has most recently been in the news following the nationally publicized murder of George Floyd. Uh, George Floyd was an unfortunate catalyst in the fight for equality in the face of law enforcement, and as a result, demonstrations were held nationally and locally. Uh, demonstrations here in Bakersfield were held all over town. Um, you may have seen them downtown, in the Rosedale area, in the southwest, uh, and almost always were met with opposition. Uh, just as in the national demonstrations as well. So the Blue Lives Matter group created, um, was created as a direct response to the Black Lives Matter group, uh, and it was in support of law enforcement officers. And usually when these Black Lives Matter demonstrators uh, met and had uh, protests or any other demonstration, they were often met with Blue Lives Matter uh, supporters. Uh, the Black Lives Matter demonstrations also uh, led nationally and locally led to calls to reform or defund the police as we know it. Um, so one person that was instrumental in organizing Black Lives Matter demonstrations at a local level and organizing local outreach is Erica Harris. Uh, Harris runs the 661 Voices Heard page on Instagram. Uh, this page is dedicated to serving the community by advocating and fundraising for those in need and defending the rights of the, the historically disenfranchised. Uh, as I said, Harris was instrumental in the local Black Lives Matter demonstration by raising awareness and encouraging change in the community. She recorded her their demonstrations and interactions with the police, uh, police officers and oppositions on Instagram Live. 
Uh, this was a way to let the community know what was going on in their own community. And unfortunately, uh, in November 2020, Harris was attacked at an organized demonstration on Panama Lane by Trump supporters. And I, I say Trump supporters only because that is how the individuals identified themselves. And also to say that not all conservatives or all Republicans were in support of Donald Trump. Um, and as I said, this is how they identified themselves. Um, so she was met with some opposition uh, from Trump supporters, even though the demonstrations were not at all affiliated with the up upcoming election at that point, or with President Trump. Um, this is not to say that there was no political propaganda present, but um, it wasn't officially aligned with the election. Um, unfortunately, Eric Harris was attacked with bear mace and was also being berated uh, by racial slurs um, by these individuals. And she was actually able to record her attack. So I'm going to see, hopefully this link works. I can't really hear it. Uh, well, I mean, you can see uh, there's a bit of spray being sprayed into her car. That's her back there. Um, Sorry, I have to put that out there. Oh, dang it, I did that. Okay. Okay. for a 20 year old. And they're spraying shit in my car. You just spray that. I got it on video. I have it on video. You spray shit in my car, bro. You're literally grown as fuck. No, he, he, he sprayed pepper spray in my car. Bear mace? You sprayed bear mace in my car? Uh, in this situation, the police did not help her and allowed her then alleged attackers to leave the area. Uh, although Harris and others accused Trump supporters of a crime during that interaction. Um, the BPD, the Bakersfield Police Department, did not react. Uh, however, in instances where the Black Lives Matter supporters were accused of crimes by the opposition, they were met with guns drawn and handcuffs. Uh, this is a point that Harris makes in this video. It's hopefully big. When they just committed a felony, they sprayed uh, somebody with bear mace, and I made that very clear to both officers. Though I told you I could call him, and I told you I had it on video, and I asked you not to let them leave the scene. I, he was here. That's false. We need we need one person talking. We need one person talking. That that doesn't make any sense because somebody had mentioned on the other side of town that one of us had a gun, and BPD drew their gun, their guns at us and had those men get out of the car. Right? I'm telling you that I had it on video, and the the people were still there. I asked you do not let them. Had it on video that they cre they committed a felony, and I could show you the victim come out, and you guys are still letting them leave. Why are they able to leave the scene? I'm a victim too, but they they just surrounded me. They just surrounded me, harassed me. They just surrounded me and blocked me in the parking lot. They tried to hit my phone multiple times. I have it. I'm still live. I have all of this online. It's a step. So in this video. Uh you can see that they're not really trying to help her. Um, this demonstration particularly was affiliated with the Defund the Police initiative and demonstrations. Um, and there's a following video, but for the sake of time, I'll just summarize it for you. Um, she accuses the police officers of not helping her. Um, and they say, you got nothing, you got nothing, okay, good, let's go. Essentially, they don't want to help her. Uh, they ask for their badge numbers, and they all say it at the same time, and the victims in the case were not able to write them down correctly. Um, so that's what's in the second video, and because of that video, um, the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, uh, found the PD to be biased during this rally where defunding the police was brought up. 
Um, this quote says, when officers exercise their enforcement discretion in a discriminatory matter based on speech, they violate the First Amendment. We are concerned that BPD officers appear to have discriminated, discriminated against Black Lives Matter protesters when the officers refused to entertain, let alone investigate, the reports of improper use of mace by pro-police individuals. Uh, due to their inaction, BPD, uh, the ACLU claims that BPD is in violation of the constitutional rights of those affected uh, for treating protesters unequally due to their own bias. Uh, Erica Harris's attackers serve three out of four serve no less, uh, or, sorry, a year or less in jail and no more than a year probation due to charges of battery and challenging a fight in a public place. In conclusion, uh, there has been very little change in the treatment of communities of color by local law enforcement. Law enforcement agents uh, play a significant role in the outcome of the cases they investigate. As such, there is no room for racial bias in law enforcement. As we can see the outcomes of that from cases, all, um, all the cases in this presentation. And this is just one box of archival material that I was able to get my hands on uh, in the Historical Research Center. So one can't really help but wonder what else is out there and what other cases were mishandled uh, under the authority of Jacob Horace Stoops, and how many voices continue to be silenced by local law enforcement today. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to open up the floor for questions. Um, I'm going to take the mic with me in case I have people in the back so that everybody up front can hear you. Is there anybody that has a question? I can actually ask something for the questions. Uh, I would like to add some overlap to Eileen's research and just show how well protected the color line is in the 30s and 40s, right? We see housing segregation. We also see the color line being upheld by the police. I just want to make that overlap comment. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and answer. Hi. Um, two things. I hope I remember the second one. The first one has to do with something Donato said about there wasn't even a map of Bakersfield to look into redlining, which is amazing. There wasn't even a map. And it, it brought to memory uh, a presentation that once heard by Dr. Oliver Rosales of, uh, of the situation in Bakersfield at the time. And he pointed out that the struggle African Americans and Latinos were waging and they form a united front was to simply incorporate the neighborhoods in which they lived into the city. That means they were not acknowledged to exist. They were not in any map because they weren't incorporated. And so the first battle uh, it must be the police. <laughs> so it's, it, it, I hear from what that presentation that the first battle for civil rights at that time was for being incorporated. It was an alliance of black and Latinos. And I don't know if you, you have archival. Uh, yeah, it's a little All right. I'll, I'll leave it at that one first. That's the one, too. There's another question after that. Sure. I'll double that last two So I, I'm going to talk about the map, and I'll see if I can bring it up real quick so you can see. I can kind of tell you my, so I really talk about my research methodology. Uh, let's see, okay, so this, remember I told you the 171 uh, racially restricted map uh, covenants? This, I sat at the Hall of Records and read all the covenants and made sure, and I made a list, and I worked with a demographer who made the map for me, so someone that knows GIS, I, I gave him all the tracks, and he went and color-coded them all uh, to the date. So I, I, I sat there for at least a week just reading them all, and uh, I actually, asked about printing them, they're terribly expensive to print sources there. They're $3 for each first page, and then thereafter is 50 cents. 
So it's about $500 just for the first pages. So I, I sat there and read them all, right? So we created this map, and this actually represents what you think of a redlining map. All the neighborhoods that are highlighted are all neighborhoods that were financed. We know that because we have the benef benefit of hindsight as historians, we know they got built, right? So uh, we can see the one with the stars, actually a black neighborhood. And that's that neighborhood that Dr. Santos is talking about. Uh, that's the Mayflower Track, and that was an un unincorporated area of Bakersfield. And it was part of the county. And the star signifies because a white real estate agent did build new homes for blacks here, but they did it in the segregation styles. Like you can have it, but only in your neighborhood, right? They didn't build black neighborhoods anywhere else except there, especially new ones. So it, it's an area where there was a lot of uh, poverty, but then also there was one block that did have new houses. And they did it because they wouldn't have open housing, right? So they did it in that neighborhood. What the, Dr. Santos is referring to is in 1950, actually, it's actually a series of votes. So I think it starts in 48, 49, and then again in 50. The Mayflower tra track where the star is, you can see that block. Um, they fought to get incorporated to the city to get the sewer, to get city services, to get lights on the street. Before that, it was dirt roads and outhouses, right? Uh, and I uh, actually did more, uh, so with, so just to say the, the power to the neighborhood is yes, he's getting some city services and in the incorporation of that neighborhood also allows there to be enough of a, a black and brown population in the city to elect the first uh, black city council member, uh, Reverend uh, Henry Collins, right? So we can see that power kind of given to the, those in the city once they're incorporated, right? 1950s incorporation is December of 1950. And by 1953, they had their first black city council member. So we can see kind of that fight and what it equals to to get representation in there. Uh, what my research shows later, and I don't know if it's been talked about, I know I didn't talk about this, my research is a lot, but uh, whenever uh, they did that, a lot of people lost their homes because they were bonded into debt to get sewer, to get connected to the sewer, right? So when the city annexed them, they didn't just have them over free. They put them into debt uh, in taxes, right? And they had to pay, a lot of people lost their homes. And in the Historical Research Center, we have a real estate agent, uh, Claude Blodgett, who sold homes in that area. And there's at a point where uh, he would really do is he would sell homes to people, and if they didn't get to the down payment part, he never took them to the Hall of Records to get them registered. So all he did was resell it, right? So there, there's a month where he sells 16 houses. He resells them, right? So we can see the, the vast number of properties lost to taxes. So every time they would get lost, he would go buy out their taxes, and then resell them again and, and keep that cycle of reselling, 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 reselling. So the other untold story is, yeah, they get representation, yeah, they get city services, but at what cost, right? Okay, thank you. Uh, so that map is your map. You you never found it anymore. No. You have to build it. Yeah, so we ended up it's building amazing. it together. It's amazing. Yeah. amazing. Yeah. And that's just Bakersfield. I mean, there's like, there's at the time, there's houses in Arvin, Wasco, Shafter, Tehachapi, Fraser Park. This is just Bakersfield. All right. My second question, if I may, uh, very interesting presentations, by the way. The fact that I'm asking him doesn't mean I'm not going to ask you later. Uh, uh, the second question is, is, is a question I have. I le legitimately do not know. I'm very puzzled by this. Maybe you can enlighten me. And that has to do with the legal whiteness of Mexicans. Okay, so since the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, uh, because of the clause in the treaty that said that automatically Mexicans at state would become citizens, and citizenship at that time was restricted to whites, we started the ball rolling so that Mexicans were legally white. And many uh, Mexicans, when they baptized their kids, when they registered their kids, they registered them as white race. So there was a, an ambiguity built into uh, the question of whiteness in places like California. So the question, given the covenants, defining who may not come is non-white and non-Caucasian. How did that play out with Mexicans? Sure. Oh, I'll just say that's a good question. I well, from what I've seen from Bakersfield is that uh, Latinos were, for the most part, segregated. And from other studies that I've seen, um, there's a book called In Search of Mexican Beverly Hills by uh, Jerry Gonzalez. And he talks about how um, some Mexicans were able to buy homes in restricted neighborhoods. And it was the, uh, the same that uh, some African Americans were able to do by the ability of passing, right? 
you pass for white and you didn't talk about your race, right? So there seems to be more of that. And then uh, there is ambiguity. Most of what historians have referred to as Hispanic surnames, right? And there isn't like a certainty to whether they are Hispanic or not. So I think there's more research to it, but we can see that it's in Bakersfield, it's a wider effect. The, uh, the clip that I showed, the uh, one where Jesse Acala, uh, that was a primarily Hispanic school at the time. It was about 70%. And we can see the drastic effects of segregation. Uh, the report that I showed from 1935, uh, it was a real estate agent that did admit to racially segregating Mexicans and housing policies, right? So, but, but we also see some wider effects. I think it's not like a, it isn't as a hard of a line, right, that we think of. And I think segregation is that at some, some points we do have the hard line, sometimes we don't. We can see like the, the first desegregation cases, uh, Mendes versus Westminster, and that's Mexicans, right? So um, there is limited success as well. Do we have another question? Hi. You did really good, by the way. You said Thank you were nervous. You. I was. I still. Oh. Yeah. You're still nervous? Yeah. Okay, so um, I always look at like the really like, uh, like how Kern was like back in the day, and there's books like on old Chinatown in Kern County in Bakersfield. Where was that and what happened? Do you know anything about that? You know what I think? I'm going to show you books I then. Do not. I do okay, not. I'll yeah. check them out at the library and I'll show you. Because it's all like Chinatown and there's all these pictures. And then I'm like, where was it and where did it go? It's uh, just Elm Street? Street? Chris Livingston says Elm Street. Is that Elm Street? Yeah. Elm Street uh, is also the, uh, the temple that's on, I want to say, the 19th Street? 19th and L ish. Yeah. Down, uh, across from Mexicali. Okay. Uh, We actually had two Chinatowns, oh, okay. which, which, you know, that was very unique for the experience. I was like, I'll see the pictures, and I'm like, whoa, and then it's like, oh, where? And then there's an earthquake, so I assume that's probably why a lot of it was gone. But I'm just curious if I can't make a research. I can add to that. Uh, there hasn't been many comprehensive studies done on a lot of uh, communities of color here in Bakersfield. Okay. Uh, in my research, uh, there's a very short paper by Diana Ogden, which is in like 19, early 1970s. Uh, her first paper was Blacks in Bakersfield, and her second one in 1973 was uh, History of Chinese in Bakersfield. So there, I mean, if that's the first comprehensive study in the 70s, I think we're a little, uh, we're a little behind, yeah. Okay. That was a great question. How many of the neighborhoods that are largely uh, black or uh, Hispanic now are the result of that, that, yeah. that, that uh, kind of uh, restrictive uh, covenant. I can talk about the transformations. I think you're hinting to like what has happened today. So, uh, and a lot of you weren't for the uh, Bill Memorial Library. We actually had some racial concentration maps from 80, 90, and 2020. So I'll kind of pinpoint them. Uh, I guess I'll walk over here and show you guys. So in 1950, you really see this is largely where Mexican black populations were, and then everything else seems to be mostly white, and that's confirmed with some uh, demographic data. So we were able to look at 1980, where um, I gave some historical maps to uh, my friend Jesus, and then he went and put population density over them, and I don't have them right now. But uh, it was able to show that 1980, a lot of this was still true, right? It was very white black and Mexican, and then uh, as historians have observed, the term, it's called white flight, is where uh, white residents uh, leave older and aging and more dilapidated neighborhoods for newer neighborhoods, right? So it was from east to southwest, and then so in the 90s, we had a shift of population leaving the east and heading more into the southwest. We look at like the Silver Creek area. So by 90, this population was kind of left here and gone more into the southwest and into Roseville. And then by 2020, they've left uh, the Southwest. They're, they're almost non-existent in the East Side and in the Southwest, and predominantly around this, a little bit of this area, but actually what we think of the Oildale and Roseville and all the drive area. So the Northwest is what predominantly the population. So it's gone from kind of the older areas. This is like kind of the new East Side, the new Southwest. And by 80, they're shifting to the Southwest and 
in modern times have shifted over here, and that's where we've gotten the larger concentrations of uh, Hispanic and black populations here. And these are also now older and aging homes that require more care, so the, the, the neighborhoods are also, uh, we think of like deteriorating in that sense, right? Where they need, we need more urban investment to keep these up, up to standard. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. So I first want to say thank you to all three panelists for your um, presentations. It definitely illuminated a lot for all of us here in the room. And I want to uh, capitalize on one of the comments that Donato, you made um, when you framed it as uncomfortable truth. And I see that as something that kind of transfers on all three presentations. And my question is really, so once we get to the point of discussing these uncomfortable truths, what next? Well, I can go, but I've been talking a lot. I don't know if you guys want to go first, and then I'll chime in. Well, for me, I'm focused on changing things in the public school system here. So the, the first thing is to uncover the stories and find out what's actually going on here. Kern County's left off the map from everything I've found so far. Um, I'm, I can assume that because the biggest uh, concentration of Muslims is in Orange County, LA County. Um, we can compare and contrast just based on what we know of Kern County versus LA. It's much more diverse, different political climate, different people, and the broader community. And the Muslim community there is also very different, um, more diverse, um, different educational levels. So just those kind of ideas alone make me think that you know Kern County warrants some some investigation and. The first step is getting people counted somehow. Um, language, I think, is gonna be key because we can't count students by their religion, um, but we can look at getting SWANA um, people counted as separate from white so that legal whiteness comes up again. They're legally white, which serves them in no way. Um, so getting counted and, and getting some data just to find out what we may or may not already think we know, um, and then serving and supporting the students. Uh, well, I want to start with my research was born of like the 2020 demonstrations that I talked about. Um, I am not the type of person to go out and enact change um, physically. Like I wasn't at any rallies or anything. Um, I have anxiety, so I'm not doing that. <laughs> um, but I do think that the part, I, I play a certain part by having all this research done and it will make its way into my thesis and to have this hard of like evidence is these facts um, supported by my arguments. Um, it's gonna do something because you know, in the news we hear like fake news and then how, how can I really believe that if that's just something you're saying? Um, well, I have the arguments and I have uh, like yeah the evidence for it you know um, and I'm hoping in that way it will enact some change um, as far as my research it, the change is already kind of happening and that's amazing um, so I hope that in that way I'm contributing um, to some more change you know that's something and um both, uh, you know, a doctoral candidate, a master's student. They're also uh, going to be writing this in their, you know, dissertation, their thesis, and contributing to academia in that sense, right? They, they, they write and people read it, right? And that's how I got kind of connected with a lot of groups. Uh, right now, uh, my research has been used. Um, it was used in the um, reparations task force in one of the uh, interim reports to describe segregation and use of restricted covenants in Bakersfield. So in uh, many senses, it gets picked up, right? And people do use it. Uh, the one that I was most involved was uh, providing this type of research to the uh, conversation of redistricting, right? So they were talking about housing and the shift of populations and how the uh, demographic has changed and how the, the power of the districts have followed the shift in demographics, which is incredibly interesting, right? And, and, and it's barely on its baby steps. I think the most enlightening part that we found was like two days, or maybe like about seven or 
seven maybe days ago when uh, we overlaid some of this historical information and demographic research on top of uh, maps from 1980, 1990, and things that we got from the Board of Supervisors, right? So uh, it kind of opens your eyes to what are future avenues. So, and uh, you know, people do call you to collaborate for other things, and, and a lot of it has to do with social change today. I would also say that we're in a library, and I hope it gets people curious, and they come and they do research, and they ask us questions, and that's the biggest part of just starting that conversation and hoping that those conversations translate into the classroom. And then from the classroom, it goes to members of our community and to the electorate and to hopefully the eventual change of policy. So we're beginning somewhere and that's really exciting that we can be here and that you're all here to hear about it. Yeah, Hi. and I just wanna comment since, uh, you know, I work in the Historical Research Center, so does Eileen, in collaboration with Chris, we do a lot of uh, community outreach, community archiving. We also, uh, if students come in, uh, we also show them these resources. I mean, Eileen, I, I think we had conversations about this box and she went and read them, right? So just making students aware that there are historical uh, primary resources that, that haven't been seen or haven't been seen in a long time or haven't been drawn to the attention like that. You know, sometimes I do get calls and they're, uh, I, I, I know uh, Dr. Santos mentioned Oliver Rosales who's a professor of history at Baseball College the other day he called me. He's like, how do I get all those restricted covenants? I was like, well, you go to the Hall of Records, you learn how to navigate, you know, so you, you, you teach them forward, right? And then he teaches people forward and he creates students and, and then that's how you continue to, uh, you know, develop the area of study. If I can add something to continue to answer your question. Um, usually Kern County and Bakersfield are known for like two things and that's oil and, and agriculture, right? I mean, but we're, we're more than that and I think that's why, because then we think you know, Bakersfield, it's a pit stop, right? Everybody kind of throws this under the rug and there's not much research done in this area and I think that by bringing, by putting Bakersfield and Kern County on the forefront and publishing about it and doing research about it can enact change because if not, I mean, we're a pretty isolated place and nothing's going to get fixed unless we call attention to it. Like after they start talking, I'm thinking also of uh, future efforts, um, professional development for future educators, um, because we overlook the religious element when we talk about diversity. We talk about race, we talk about all the other things, but nobody wants to talk about the diversity of the people that you know play mother. First of all, I want to just thank the panel for having the courage to do something like this because it takes a lot of courage just based on the historical fact of the United States as a whole. Um, I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan, and I graduated out of high school in the 70s. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> and the reason I bring that up is because discrimination has been around for years, and everybody knows that. But it just amazes me how. The same thing that I saw back in Michigan is the same thing as far as education, of how the white students lived in the suburbs and the black students lived in the city. There's a, there's a street in Detroit called Eight Mile. You saw, I'm sure you heard in the movie Eight Mile. Eight Mile separated the white people from the black people. The minute you cross Eight Mile, you better be careful what time you went on the other side of Eight Mile. Yeah, I say all this because I see the same thing here in Bakersfield. I'm a rich, I came here in California from, in 1986 and I moved to Ventura County. And I saw the discrimination in Ventura County, but I always heard about Bakersfield. I mean, Bakersfield really had a reputation, believe it or not, even in, in Ventura County. And I was told never go to Bakersfield. That's what I was told. And I always wondered, like, why not go to Bakersfield? I always wondered that. But I had friends that lived in Bakersfield and I came here and visited. I say all this is because Bakersfield do have a reputation of racism outside of Bakersfield, Kern County. And I heard about it and I'm all the way from Michigan. So just, I don't know what all went on here. I got a feeling that a lot went on here in Kern County that we probably just scratching the surface of it. But it's just pretty sad that it got perpetuated for so long 
and no one did anything about it. But we know the reason because of that, because white power had the power and that type of thing. And I say all that, and I hope it didn't prevent me from moving here. At first, I was kind of hesitant about moving here just because based on the, relate, the reputation. And believe me, trust me, it, Bakersfield do have a reputation outside of Kern County. And I'm just being real with you guys. So I was hesitant when I got an opportunity to come here to get a job, I was hesitant. My wife and I, we drove up, and I'm, I'm gonna cut it short. We drove up and we, you know, I toured the city because you can get, you can notice a lot just by driving around. And I did notice the segregation immediately. I drove the east, the, the northeast side, we drove the, the southeast side, the southwest side, and the northwest side. Now, I had the money to buy a home, so I immediately was attracted to the northwest side, but I noticed that, you know, the people walking around, and I would go into the stores, and I was like, oh, okay, I see what this is about. And then, <laughs> and then I went to the other side of town, the east side, and I noticed there is a, still a segregation to this day. And so we ended up moving to Shaft which is, don't ask me how we got out there, but it was me. <laughs> And so, everybody said, why are you moving to Shaft? And I'm like, why not? But see, I had this mentality, I don't really care about, excuse me, please, I hope the white people don't be offended. I really don't care about, you know, what white people or any big people care about. As long as my money's spent, I spend it, I'm gonna move where I want to. And I say all this is that because I think people have to have the courage to do and go where you want to be and don't be afraid, even in 2022. I hope y'all understand where I'm going with this. And this history, it does need to be investigated because there's a lot of history we probably don't even know about. And then a lot of people that was in power, especially the police, covered, I'm sure they covered up a whole lot of stuff. I mean, this is nothing new. No, and I just, that's just, I just want to make that comment that you can't be afraid I mean, I heard you say, you know, I don't want to get involved in that type of stuff. But you know, you, you don't I, and you don't have to, I get it. But you also, when you see it wrong, you do have to speak up about it. Don't be afraid to say it. Because if you don't, then things, I heard someone say, well, how do we change this? Well, they ain't going to never change if you don't speak out about it. Or, or find a way to be proactive. Anyway, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you for coming. And then I, I do have a book suggestion for you. Uh, let me check it out. It's a barrel Seder, and it's family property. So if you look at the end, Seder, and she talks about Detroit and, and this style of segregation uh, that was very prominent in the urban north and the, mm -hmm. and the west. And, it, and it, it has very similar outcomes because they're really staying true to this style of housing segregation, right? So see a lot of the, but if you're interested in specifically Detroit, that's the book. But, but speaking of Detroit, Detroit was highly segregated. I mean, it's, it's just phenomenal how, because I remember when my mom was born to buy a home and we lived on like the northeast side of Detroit and we decided to go closer, I don't know, if you probably wouldn't know this there, but it's closer to like Rose Point, which is kind of considered like Beverly Hill site. Kind of Beverly Hill site, and the minute we went, the closer we got to Rose Point, the wider they got. But we st <laughs> I'm just being real. And, and so when we, when my mother decided to buy this house, I, the realtor was trying to talk her out of it. I mean, he just, I mean, just tried to talk her out of it. And I remember that even as a teenager. I, and I, that's something I just never forgot, how people would discriminate against you, especially in housing. And you know, that's what civ part of the civil rights was all about, was the right to be able to move where you want to move to. And housing was a big thing. But we all know the whole thing about it is all about money. Everything is about money. And oh, one more thing, and I'm done. <laughs> I noticed one thing about Bakersfield that it has a lot of oil. I never knew that until I got here. You know, people say, oh, the oil town, but I never knew until I went and looked out over the hill and looked at all those oil fields. And, in my mind, that's to me, that's probably was part of the reason why there was a lot of discrimination around this county, because there's a lot of oil. And when there's oil, there's money. It's something to think about. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm getting 
my stepson. Yeah, I uh, was going to mention that before the 1930s, in the 18, well, right after the Civil War, they had a few Indian tribes out in Shafter. And when I grew as a kid, they used to have rabbit drives clubbing it out. But the um, kind of interesting, following the Civil War, I, you're aware of the Kern County Land and Cattle Company? And they put in the deeds about the Colorado people. Because they were recruiting people after the Civil War, which didn't go too well for Southerners. And they wanted to recruit and bring them out so they uh, could advertise that Bakersfield had no money of minority in it. And if you go down 99 from the south and go up to, well, of course, by the largest source of checks of Kern County at the time, the welfare office, see a sign that says, entering Bakersfield. There's a lot of area that was still there, but it was uh, non-white. It was not in Bakersfield, and it was county. And the stuff that's still going on is, those people that live there, how well protected are they? How many cops do they have there, or sheriffs, deputies? Two. <coughs> That's for, what, 50,000? And the, uh, it kind of went, and if you notice our great book about uh, the grapes of wrath, there's something lacking in there. And it's on purpose, because it probably wouldn't sell the book. And that was minorities. And when I grew up in, uh, senior year, 54, went to uh, parochial school, Catholic high school. Still there, different instructors. It had the uh, Christian brothers. And they did a neat fundraising. They had to put on a, for the students and then for the parents, uh, and charged a buck entrance. They put on the coon show. And in it, the, the coaches, when I was giving lessons on how to walk like a nigger. And this stuff kept going up until uh, they left. And the uh, book about that, pretty good, is by Leroy Chatfield called The Unchristian Brothers. And it's, it's it's still going on, you know, some of the original. But a lot of them, I guess, the, the deeds and the covenants that were restricted were put in there not by the city. They were put in there by the land company so that they would be able to have a lily white area. I think. So I'd like to comment on the uh, racially restrictive uh, covenant. So yeah, the, so before the covenant era, we do get race restrictions, but at the single home level, and we get more segregation at the uh, block level, right? Uh, so the, the language actually, I think the first time they use it is, I, I think it's New Jersey, and it's like like the 1800s. It's just really early, and they have a, a very strong influence to what the FHA does because they, uh, like you mentioned, they, they have success selling homes, right? And they kind of use that as a template. So be, it's not to say that before 1930 there wasn't race restrictions, there just wasn't at the track level. It was at the single home and block level. So we see more of the racial concentration at small blocks rather than entire neighborhoods, multiple neighborhoods, right? So the expansive effect is uh, 1938, between 1938 and 1950, right? I'd like to comment on your Grapes of Wrath comment. So lately, what we've seen in the scholarship recently is that historians are trying to uh, right the wrongs of well, the Grapes of Wrath and uh, older historians. So during that time, that was the Dust Bowl migration, uh, what the book was talking about, right? And at that time was also the Great Migration, which was a mass exodus of 
southern um, southern blacks moving uh, northward and westward. Uh, this was over the span of around 30 plus years. Um, so there are, I mean, we have an oral history um, digitized in our collection. I can't remember the name of the person specifically, but she was a black, uh, like, a Dust Bowl migrant. So that there's two. So she was not only a Dust Bowl migrant, she was part of the Great Migration as well. Uh, by coming westward, so that is an effort that historians have been trying to correct, um, and I think you can see that in uh, James Gregory's um, The Southern Diaspora book, in case you're interested. And then the names are uh, Johnny Mae Parker, who comes from Texas, and Christina McClanahan, that comes from uh, Boley, Oklahoma, which is a black woman city. And then I think Kristen might be able to talk some of that through the uh, Dust Bowl photographs. So in our research for the Factor Fiction exhibit that was about the Dust Bowl, um, I did research on Dorothy and Lane. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question? Sometimes, sometimes our, uh, the races don't get, can't get things straightened out. They just don't work too well. And on me, over by the um, fairgrounds, there is it's not a uh, boss. And they had to get a, a variant to put up a high cyclone fence because the people were running over there because, well, they were turbans. So they're the ones we want to get. And they were, t t uh, the fence was to break up the, um, the little uh, Molotov cocktails they kept throwing at the place and torching it off. But they had the wrong religion, but uh, that's why it's got that fence that eye. Are we on time? 5.33. So I think uh, this is going to make a lot more conversation. So we're hoping maybe in the spring we can do another panel and uh, have some new guests and some more research. So I just want to thank everybody for coming here tonight. And uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up for this evening. And again, if you have more questions. No, I just got one more comment. Sure. Just, just to the panel, if you want to really go deeper into the great, mig great migration of African American is, if you get a chance, go to the African American Museum in Washington, D.C. And, you, and if you go there, and you can get history all the way back to the beginning of slavery. So it's just a suggestion if you're looking for a place to get some more There's also Isabel Woodperson's The Warmth of Other Sons, which is an amazing book about the Great Migration, too, as well. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. It was wonderful having you here.